God kveld. Mitt navn er Erik Fugleset. Jeg er juryformann i fotografiprisen. Og med meg så har jeg Ariel Søntrø fra juryen og Jens Eldøy fra Norske Fagfotografers Fond. Først og fremst, tusen takk til Trond Harald Saltnes for disse vakre toner. Og samtidig så vil jeg også gjerne takke Nordic Light Festivalen for at vi har fått nok en gang være her og dele ut prisen i denne fine rammen. Litt om fotografiprisen. Den ble innstiftet i 1989 og utdeles av Norske Fagfotografers Fond. Prisen er på 100 000 kroner og utdeles hvert annet år. Fotografiprisen utdeles for å stimulere seriøs bruk av fotografi og gis til en fotograf som i særdeles grad har utmerket seg på en faglig og kreativ måte. Prisen er den største fotografiprisen i Norge, tilsvarende Brageprisen er for forfattere. Vinneren skal over tid ha demonstrert en kombinasjon av høy faglig integritet og kreativitet. Tidligere vinnere av fotografiprisen er Morten Krogvold, Knut Bry, Dag Alveng, Kjell Sten Tollefsen, Agnete Brun, Herdis Maria Sigert, Tom Sandberg, Per Manning, Jonas Bendiksen og nå til sist Rune Johansen i 2011. Årets prisvinner er en norsk suksess i USA. Og det var nok så tilfellig at han oppdaget foto som en kreativ utfoldelse i unge år. Og etter en snartur innom Sogndal Folkehøyskole og den trønderske reklamefotografen Geir Tore Nergårds oppfordring om å dra til utlandet, satte 22-åringen seg på flyet til San Francisco i 1995. Der gikk han fire år på Academy of Art University, og da kom godt betalte oppdrag for å se og høre for å dekke Krompins Håkons studier i San Francisco godt med. Deretter klarte han etter eget utsagn å mase seg til en assistentjobb og noen års blodslit hos den kjente reklamefotografen Jim Erickson. I dag er han en stor suksess i USA, og karrieren har helt og holden tatt av. Kundelisten omfatter for eksempel Toyota, Microsoft, Harley Davidson, Hilton Hotels, American Airlines, vi kunne nevnet mange, Nike, Puma og ikke minst Absolut Vodka, for å nevne noen. Og med de største reklamebyråene på kundelisten er han blitt berømt og ettertraktet som en av USAs mest anerkjente og respekterte reklamefotografer. Han har et helt eget fotografisk uttrykk og arbeider innen områdene livsstil, mote, portrett og kunstfotografi. Han sier selv at hans suksess er frukten av beinert arbeid og stå på mentalitet. Og han fremhever hvor viktig det er å hele tiden utvikle sitt eget uttrykk. Og ikke minst markedsføre seg selv i et tøft marked. Hans oppdragsgivere forteller om en fotograf som er til fingerspissene profesjonell, som er en drøm å jobbe med, og som alltid leverer mer og bedre enn ventet. Hans hjemmebase er San Francisco, men han har også åpnet et avdelingskontor i New York. Han har ikke bare en imponerende kundeliste, han har også en svært imponerende merittliste. I år vant han titelen Best Commercial Photographer i F Awards, og han hadde bilder i siste Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. Og han fotograferte American Airlines nye look, og ikke minst Absolut Vodkas siste kampanje. Årets prisvinner er premiert og omtalt i et vel av prestisjefulle konkurranser og publikasjoner. Han mottok intet mindre enn 12 hedelige omtaler i 2012 International Photography Awards i USA, og han ble dommernes valg i ASMP Image 12 Awards i fjor. Han ble profilert i American Photography, og han vant Grafis Photo Annual 100 Best in Photography, og ble kåret flere år som Lurser's Archives 200 Best Advertising Photographers Worldwide, for å nevne noen bragder. Men årets prisvinner er norsk som noen, og norske fagfotografers fond og juryen er svært glad for å kunne tildele fotografiprisen for 2013 til en fotograf som er en historieforteller i verdensklasse. 
og med en ydmyk tilnærming til faget som er svært unorsk. Fototeknisk er han brilliant, og med en fotografisk forståelse solid som grunnfjellet i Trondheim, hvor han kommer fra. Fotografiprisen for 2013 tildeles Erik Almås. Prisen er på 100 000 kroner, og den ledsages av et diplom og et historisk bilde av Anders B. Vilse. Da skal prisvinneren få si noen ord. En sånn. Det er helt fantastisk. Helt fantastisk. Jeg er veldig rørt. I could do it in English, for sure. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. What an extraordinary honor it is to receive such an award. I do feel like the luckiest guy I know. I've been saying this for years, but when I do what I find the most fun, things that really makes me so happy. Uh, and when that get recognized in a way such as this, just to have fun, um, it makes me very humble. Um, so, I'm not gonna start crying here, but I just wanna say that um, being a photographer and having so much fun and getting the recognition like this is um, means a lot. The other rewards that was mentioned, there are truly um, because of a single picture or a single campaign. Um, what I feel this represents is something that's beyond that, something that talks to the volume of work that I've done over a longer time. So um, uh, I'm just uh, super appreciative of, of the Photography Award. Now, um, when I started out um, being curious about photography, the, the two heroes of Norwegian photography was Morten Krogvold or, or Knut Bry. And um, I want to thank um, Erik Fugelset and Aril Sønsterø uh, from Jurin, who um, have found me a value to a such a fantastic group. I'm going to have a long talk at home. I just to say two things. Um, the very generous prize, and when I was nominated, I thought I would think a little bit about what I could do with such a lot of money. I was very inspired by Chris Rainier uh, this morning when he said um, on a question from Morten Krogvold, um, were the indigenous people aware of what you were doing when you were taking their picture and how did you sort of communicate with them? And he said time, which is quite an extraordinary answer. Um, he talked about ADHD and having more um, attention to our cell phones than what's around us. So with this award, I want to give part to myself and to time, and uh, dedicate um, time without work, <laughs> sorry, um, and take pictures. I want to delve into something that's more so than a two-dimensional surface, but something that portrays emotion, because uh, that's my goal in photography going forward. Um, I also want to share parts of this award, um, and I want to tell two stories. Uh, the first one starts 18 years ago, when I say I want to study photography and GT, who's here today, says, you can't do that in Norway. So um, it changed my life path with that one sentence, and it's probably the reason for me being here today. And uh, GT is still um, giving advice and teaching and have created uh, an amazing environment for photography um, at Photography School in Trondheim. Um, the second story starts three years later when I, um, as a student in the U.S., call up Martin Krogvall and I say, hey, my name is Eric Almas, I'm a photographer, would you mind taking a look at my work? And he said yes. And that was a great experience for, um, for someone that uh, wanted to accomplish big things with pictures, to have someone um, of his insight into pictures, to walk through the pictures laying on the floor talking about it. So um, there's a student award here uh, at this festival. I want to pass on uh, whatever I could share my knowledge through the past 20 years to the student and $25,000 of this award um, to pass on 
Kroner. Ja, kroner. Uh, uh, så jeg vil videre gi da 25 000 av den her fantastiske prisen til någon som kanskje trenger det like mye som meg. Så. Tusen takk. Ja, tusen takk. Um, så med det så vil jeg bare si at jeg er veldig bært, jeg er rørt, um, jeg er inspirert, og jeg vil bare si tusen takk for å få æren av å motta fotografiprisen 2013. Tusen takk. Flott. Tusen takk. Tusen takk til alle sammen. Og som Morten sier, i morgen er det en, en lecture av Erik Almås som begynner 10.30. Og jeg håper alle kommer her og får se disse fantastiske bildene og, og mange flere og høre hans egne historier rundt dette. Helt til slutt så skal jeg få lov til nok en gang å ønske velkommen Trond Harald Saltnes som skal få lov til å avslutte dette med et flott musikkstykke. Tusen takk.
Okay, yeah. Uh, the Nordic Light Festival will thank you so much for letting us host this ceremony. We are very proud and we are very honored that you do it here. And I, we really appreciate it. And uh, uh, I would say to the winner that uh, it's so nice to see a young, so wonderful photography a photographer being so humble and human uh, is a, a lot of, you know, the big guys there, out there. And I think uh, that is one of the reasons that he is so good. I talked about you. <laughs> so, uh, from all of us, we love you. <laughs> Marcel Leinov is the next one. We have talked a little about his projects, but now he's got to show more of his uh, work. He has been very important in Norwegian photography the last 10, 15 years. He, uh, Annelise has said that he's the nicest guy in the world. Uh, uh, maybe he is. But Marcel, we are proud. Marcel! We are proud to have you here. Well, Welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon, all. Oh, I see the price is still here. Congratulations. Um, I'm sure that a lot of you were here earlier, so it's probably, it probably might get a little bit boring. Because um, I'll probably repeat some of the things said in the discussion. But anyway, my name is Marcel Lelienhoff. I, uh, I was born in Holland, Rotterdam, 1966. My mother's from Bergen, my father's from Suriname, former Dutch Guyana. Um, I. Um, I've always been interested in, in visuals, and I was a keen comic book reader as a child. And um, when I became an adult, I thought to myself, I want to work in movies. And um, I think I was about 17, 18 years old, and I, uh, I wanted to work with special effects, so I wrote letters to uh, all the directors that I admire the most, or admired, you know, Spielberg and George Lucas and yeah, people like that. Just to get some information about how to get into the movies. But of course I didn't get any replies. So I thought to myself, I'm not going to work in that because it's, it's a rotten business. I, uh, I then bought a camera. I got a job as an assistant to a commercial photographer in, uh, in Bergen called Leif Monilsen. Fantastic guy great photographer, and I worked there for six months, and then I uh, went to Songdal, did six months course up there, and from then on, it was all uh, an uphill struggle. I, got a, I went to London College of Printing, I did a BA, and then I did a master in photography and advertising. And then I stayed on in London, I worked I stayed for about 13 years, met my wife, moved back to Norway in 
the rest is history. So now you know a little bit about me. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about today is um, my project about the Hells Angels in Norway, and also another book project called Room 13, which is a smaller project, but that's going to be just the end of the, the talk. If anybody has questions, please ask, because it's usually really boring listening to one person just uh, talk all the time. Um, about eight years ago, I did a book which is called, oh, I've forgotten what it's called now, I've done so many books, And to Dust Thou Shalt Return. I went to New Mexico and I drove cattle uh, for three weeks, worked as a cowboy, and I did um, a book about the cowboy life. Because I have this belief that for me to uh, keep uh, a bit of sanity and creativity, I need to do my own projects. Because most of the work that I do is actually commissioned by others. I work in advertising, I do fashion, a little music work, I direct videos, things like that. So I try every year to sort of come up with something new. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to go from the horse to the iron horse. And I want to do a project about the biker world. And from then, from there, I went on and I uh, said, I want to pick the, the, the biker club, which is on top of the, the biker pyramid, which is the Hells Angels. It's the biggest club in the world, probably the most difficult club to get into, and probably the most difficult club to do a book about. Um, there are only three books, as far as I know, so a combination of pictures and words done about the Hells Angels, one in Britain, one in Sweden, and one in Germany. Um, I sent all the chapters in Norway, eight of them, my book on the cowboys, and I assumed that it would be an easy thing to do. They said yes, and then they said no. Because the way it works within the Hells Angels is that one member, one vote. So somebody didn't want to do it, and that, then that was it. But I said, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go for this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on you guys until you say yes. And uh, about a year later, they said, okay, we'll do it. But that was the start of a long journey, because then it meant it had to go to Europe which meant that all the chapters in Europe had to say yes. One chapter, one vote. They said yes. Then another year went by, then it went to the world meeting, which means all the chapters in the world have to say yes. And they said yes last summer. Um, so it's been a, a pretty long um, journey for me, but it's been worthwhile. Uh, it's not finished. The book is coming out next May. So I still have a, a year of work to do, but um, I do it with great joy. What I've tried, or what I'm trying to achieve, which some people might think that I'm not, is to show that the members of the Hells Angels are more than gun-touting thugs with the gun in one hand and cocaine in the other. Um, they are humans like the rest of us, and I think it's important that in a society like ours, where we have free speech, where we are, you know, we're all equal, and we have to try and understand each other. Even if you don't like something, you have to try and understand it. And there are so many groups in our society that we don't understand. We, you know, we, we, we hear, see on the news that the gypsies are running around with axes and knives and fighting in Oslo, or we think that the Somalis are all... Um, um, cutting little girls' genitalia to pieces, things like that. It's important to broaden our mind. Um, so that's what I'm attempting to do. I'm just attempting to show how these people live, who they are, because we never see that in newspapers. You only see the back of the Hells Angel and, and a big sort of uh, headline saying, oh, Hells Angel, da 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 I've seen them. I've ridden with them. I've stayed in the clubhouses, I've been to their homes, eaten with them, I've been drinking with them, and slowly but surely, you know, a book is evolving. 
Um, yeah, I'll just start then. A lot of these images are the images from the exhibition, but at least now I can explain things as we go along. I thought it was going to be, well, stupidly thought it was going to be a rather easy job, but Hell's Angels are spread all over Norway, so it's, you know, there's a lot of traveling to do, uh, and I have to try and be present when something special happens, like a wedding or a funeral or you know, big things like that. And also, there has to be a constant communication with all the different chapters. So I, you know, so they learn about me and how I work, and that I, I'm serious about this project. Um, I suppose it becomes. I've, I've chosen to include a lot of um, uh, archival stuff as well from all the different clubs because they, a lot of them, have been writing together for about 30 years. So one. One chapter of the, uh, of the book is going to be just old pictures, all the way back from the early 80s. There are eight chapters of Hells Angels in Norway. There's one in Hamar. Some of the members are present here today. Uh, one in Oslo, one in Bergen, one in Tromsø, one in Sheen, one in Stavanger. Is that eight? I always forget one. But anyway, there are eight. I photographed the clubhouses, I photographed the bikes, the tattoos, the gifts, the jewelry, and of course the people themselves. And uh, it's not always easy because a lot of the members find it okay to be photographed, but a lot of them don't like it at all. And some of them, I'm sure, don't actually want this book to be made. But they have decided it, and uh, I'm doing it. There are an enormous amount of, of objects in, uh, you know, that they own, jewelry they own. And uh, one thing with the house angels is that Everything with Hell's Angels on it, the, uh, the jewelry with the wing on, anything that says Hell's Angels, actually belongs to the club. So if you quit, it has to go back to the club. And uh, that's very unfortunate if you have a lot of tattoos. This guy is called Supan. Probably many of you have seen him. He does a lot of stuff on TV in Norway. He's the spokesman for the Hells Angels in Norway. This is the uh, Hells Angels clubhouse in Oslo. The bar, for the strip pole and the beautiful nude lady table. As you can see on the walls, there are an enormous amount of gifts. Every time there's a jubilee, uh, you know, when a club turns one year or five year or ten years old, they get gifts from all the, the other clubs around the world. And some of the gifts are very elaborate. Now we're in Stavanger. This guy is called Rocky, and he builds motorcycles. And he's a very pleasant man. Um, in, the, in the biker hierarchy, when you, when you go into a biker club, you start out as, first you befriend the club, and then if they like you, you can become a, a hang-around, which is like a, you're, you're lowest on the, on the ladder, which means a lot of uh, really hard work. You need to clean, you need to drive the members around, pick them up from the airport, you need to cook. Um, basically, to sort of learn to, to, uh, to crawl before you can walk. And... Uh, from there, you go on to become a prospect, which is a trial member. I think the way this is done is, is basically so that you can see whether the person fits in the club or not. It's not like what you hear in the news that you have to go out and kill somebody or beat somebody up and then you become a member. I think that is a myth. This guy is called Pels. 
He is the uh, national secretary for the Hells Angels. I'm sure that a lot of people expect or have a pre preconceived idea about you know, what to expect when you photograph a biker club. Um, we discussed this a bit earlier, but uh, the way it was is not the way it is, basically. There's not a lot of drunken people running around shouting and screaming with long, greasy hair and uh, stinking clothes and things like that. That's the sort of the old, the old ways. So uh, there might be a lot of people that are disappointed uh, but I still find it a very fascinating group because it takes so much to become a member and to stay a member because you are, as soon as you become a member, there's a lot of things you can't do. It's diff more, you know, it's, a lot of members have lost their jobs. You can never go to the States again, for instance, because uh, that's, you're barred on the same, uh, in the same way as the Yakuza or the Mafia or any other Sort of, or, or terrorist groups like Al Qaeda or, or groups like that. They're in the same sort of league. So I've heard a lot about people losing their jobs because uh, they're a member and then, of course, they have to go and get benefits and then they're accused of faking, not having a job, and then it's all in a downward spiral. Um, many clubs came in, or they, they were a club before they became a Hells Angel, and this is the, the um, shabby ones, which is in Stavanger. That's their old vest before they became angels. It looks a little bit out of focus. Any questions so far? Okie dokie. Did you get your tattoos with the angels before? Did I? Your tattoos. Did I get them? With the angels or before? Uh, most of them before. I had, uh, I've been in, in subculture for a long time. I'm, I'm an old punk. So, oops, sorry. So, uh, most of my tattoos I had before. This is the clubhouse in Stavanger. They have their own uh, disco and bar. On these assignments, I usually travel around. Everything is shot either on, uh, for the people that are interested in the techniques, uh, <coughs> on my uh, Canon 5D or 1DX, or I've shot some of the portraits on the Hasselblad. So I travel around with a portable flash and one lamp and reflector, no assistant. The club in Bergen is uh, situated inside this mountain. It's an old uh, uh, railway, uh, a place where they fixed railway carts. The strange thing is that I find it's the same thing photographing these guys as anybody else, really, because as soon as you get in front of the, the camera, it's, it's all about what should I do with my hands? You know, is, does everything look okay? I think everybody has the same sort of fears, regardless of whether you are perceived as being very tough or hard. It's uh, different when you get in front of the lens. Like this guy is called Egil. He is in Hells Angels Bergen. The guy has nine children with the same wife. So I'm really looking forward to doing their family picture. And he was saying, Oh, are you going to show a chubby guy like this? You know? And I said, Yeah, I like this. You know? It's you. They even smile. But I have to say, I've been really surprised because the way they've taken me in, opened up, 
and said, you know, okay, you can come and do this. And uh, people might say, oh, they're probably doing it because they want to get a better image. But as they've said to me as well, we don't want our image to be too good. You know, we're not, as the Norwegians say, a sea club. It's a Hells Angels wedding in, in Bergen. There must be somebody curious about the world's biggest biker club. Come on, guys. Okay. Uh, are we allowed to ride anything else but Harley Davidson's? Are you? Bjorn? No. <laughs> I have seen some, some guys, though, on Triumphs. But uh, I think at some point, uh, the American Angels decided that Harley Davidson was going to be the means of transportation. But I've heard some of them also say, Sonny Barger, for one, that there's been times when they regretted not going for a Japanese bike because it's been pretty hard work for the Harleys. This is the, uh, the meeting room in uh, Tromsø. Uh, all the clubs have walls where they put up uh, pictures of fallen angels, people that have died. And they also have pictures of all the different chapters around the world. member in Tromsø. The sound of silence. Darman, yeah. Darman is the one. Yeah? How long do you need to, have to be a, a prospect before you can get a full membership? Ooh. Uh, does it differ from chapter to chapter? No, it's the same. How long? More than one year, from hang around to prospect. Mm. Why are they not allowed to come into the United States? Because they have been um, labeled as a criminal organization and barred. I think the same with Canada as well. But American angels can go anywhere in the world. Okay. They can go out and come back in, no problem. So they've actually they've launched a court case against the uh, uh, United States Justice Department to get that changed. Yeah. So how did they know that? Okay. Yeah, about it first also, Tavi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so how did they know that uh, the passport authorities? How did they know that somebody's in Hell's Angels? You don't pull it. You, uh, you, you don't send a letter saying I'm being admitted to Hell's Angels. I think it's all registered. As soon as you become a member and it's registered in the United States, that's it. Um, yeah, as far as I know. I'm not an expert on that exact fact, but I know that when you apply for a visa, or you actually don't have to do that either, but people are stopped when they come to America. So they know. Yeah? Uh, I have two questions. Yeah? There are no female members of the Hells Angels, this I know. But it's a strange thing, I bought a book uh, last year, which is done by uh, an American photographer, whose name I've forgotten, he used to be a Time Life photographer. He, did, he spent a month in the chapter in, in Burdo, in California, and in the 60s, the girls had uh, vests with full colors. But then it changed. Um, 
What was the second question? Uh, Religious. Uh, I don't know. But uh, at least I know that when they die, they want to be buried in the church, and then when they get married, they want to be married in churches. That's what I've seen. Uh, I think that religious bikers usually go to Christian biker clubs, and there are quite a few of those. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about persons being members. What about clubs? We have local club. I call them Holly Davidson clubs. Mm. Uh, Yeah. Uh, have they any chance of being a Hells Angels club? I don't know whether they're trying <laughs> or they won't. Well, uh, th that is difficult for me to, to answer because uh, it is uh, a very long sort of road to be becoming a, a prospect or a hang around chapter. But um, I can't actually say. They're here today anyway, so you can, <laughs> you can ask them yourself. <laughs> Um, it's difficult, very difficult. Yeah. About the brotherhood. the brotherhood. Well, the brotherhood. It, I suppose the way it works in, in a biker gang or a biker club, as we would like it to be, a motorcycle club. Um, is that when you, are, when you become a member, you are also brothers. And they stick together through uh, everything. You know, if, if somebody goes to jail or if somebody is ill, you know, they take care of the, the family of the person who is uh, incapable of doing so. When somebody dies, like last week in, in Oslo, um, the club will arrange for the funeral. The members fill the grave. Um, they have funds to take care of the kids of dead members. It is a very, very tight um, group of, of people. Um, I suppose you can probably compare it with uh, other sort of male clubs, maybe to the Freemasons, or it has certain similarities, I would think. But uh, I think... Uh, they have uh, something which we are starting to lack in our society. The, the, uh, the whole sort of thing of sticking together and taking care of each other. Today it seems like everybody has to fend for themselves, but uh, if you are an angel, you can go anywhere in the world, apart from America and Canada, and you'll be taken care of. And vice versa if people come to Norway. Guys, how many nations? You don't know? Three hundred. Three hundred. Is it that many? Yeah, probably, yeah. Yeah? If one guy from, say, Bergen moves to another part of Norway, which has a, a Harley Davidson chapter, will he immediately be recognized as a member there? Or? You have to you have to then get a uh, apply for a transfer, which I, I don't think it's difficult. Uh, do you, anybody have a, a clue about how many members there are in Norway? Sort of roughly, anyone? Hundred, yeah. But usually when I ask people, they go, oh yeah, three hundred, four hundred. So it's not that many, and it's rare then that, that there's more than one new member a year. This, this, this series here is, uh, is a prospect getting his colors, so becoming a full, full member. So he came into the, into the kitchen, you know, saying, oh, there's something you have to do, clean up or do something. And uh, then he was given his, uh, his vest. And it's a really special moment, as you can see from his expression.
Because then you've been you know, slaving away for two, three years, and uh, finally you are on the same level as everybody else. This is Clubhouse in Hamar, which some of the guys here are from. In the Norwegian clubs, they're usually, the clubhouses are usually very big, so everybody has, all the members have their own room. So, uh, you know, you can, you can always retire to your own. It's a little bit like a monk cell, one can say, if you can draw a comparison. There's always a bar, usually a place to work on the bikes. The gift on the right is uh, uh, quite typical. Big guns, swords, skulls, eagles, Indian heads. Yeah. The pool in the back is uh, very famous. Uh, it's been in the newspapers in Norway, I think, maybe 180 times because uh, somebody in Hama thought it was built illegally. This is a member from Sheehan. <coughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Are you allowed to bring any friends to the clubhouse? Oh, yeah. They have uh, open days, they have uh, parties, and a lot of, uh, would be amazed how many civilians, as we call them, come to the, come to the parties. Yeah? Well, <laughs> if you if you run out of uh, if you run out of of hangarounds or prospects, you have to do it yourself. <laughs> but th then you've already gone that whole road, so you know how to cook. <laughs> Anyone else? Yep. Yeah. Only killings, things like that, you know, uh, but I, I said I was never going to say anything about it. No, not, not really. It is, I have to say, I was uh, slightly surprised as well when I uh, got into the biker world that everything is very neat. All the clubhouses are neat. You know, you come somewhere in the wintertime and it will have a sign saying, please take your shoes off. Uh, so it, everything is in order, you know, there's no sort of... I've been in this for nearly three years now, and I've never seen a fight at a party. If you go to a, a club in, in the center of or Oslo, even just stand in a taxi queue, there's always a fight. Um, you know, they're wild when they ride, because they do go fast. But uh, there's been much less uh, illegal activities than I expected. Yeah. Are you going to tell us uh, about what you are doing in the next phase in your project? The next phase is going to be much more about the lives outside the club, following people to work, you know, when they take their kids to school, when they're home with their families, cooking, or even going on holiday, or you know, if they allow me. Um, because what I wanted to show was that these people have more than one sort of, they're not like a cartoon character. There are men, you know, they have many sides that are, you know, some of them like to go fishing, some of them like to play football. They're, you know, they are quite ordinary. But because they decided quite a long time ago not to say anything about how they live or, or what the club was actually about, um, 
it became very secretive. These pictures are from... Um, there was a member in Oslo that died, tragically, um, two weeks ago, and he was buried last Friday. And in the, in the basement of the clubhouse, they built like a shrine to have a... I don't know what it's called in English, but leek skua. They'd bring the coffin to the club, they have a party, dose it with uh, Jack Daniels and other things. And then uh, the brothers will take him to be buried. And this is from Oslo Domkirke. And there were members from all over the world that came to uh, participate. And the, the church was packed the rafters, more than 800 people. his son in the middle there. And the coffin was followed by about, I think about 200 bikes, all the way through Oslo, and to the church, and from the church up to the burial ground. But these were then different, different clubs from around the country. Anything else? Yep. It stands for angels forever, forever angels. Yeah? Is it expensive for the members to stay in the church? Well, uh, I can't say exactly how much each member, how much they pay, but I know that it is much more expensive than a lot of the other clubs because some of the houses are pretty big and most of the houses have been bought by the members. So to, to uh, pay the mortgage, it's pretty, pretty high, yeah. Um, in the club that I am in, because I, I joined the club myself, we only pay uh, a thousand kroners a month, but our clubhouse is very cheap. Yeah? Yeah, my, my plan was a book from the, from the go. Um, I started slowly but surely three years ago. So I've been taking pictures while this whole sort of process about you know, getting uh, the approval, and that's been going on. So I've been traveling around and taking pictures. Um, but as soon as uh, you know, I got the approval last summer, I've really been going for it. But it's quite a lot still to, to be done. This is the last picture in this uh, series. Before I go on to the next, yeah? Uh, it seems like you're still many pictures of uh, the regional members of Formai from the regional charter of Formai. Is there any restrictions about that? No, no. I, uh, I've done them as well, but it's okay. just impossible. I, I could have had a, a slideshow of three, four hundred pictures easily, but um, they'll be in the book. But they're a little bit more conservative than the rest, so I had to do them last. Yeah. Bill, you just said you joined? Not the Hells Angels, no. Oh. No. No, because you just said you couldn't go to the States then. It no, no, no. Be very <laughs> it would. No, my, my club is called Taurus. It's uh, another club. But it's, it is, you know, in, in my life, sort of doing what I do, uh, having this other world and riding motorcycles, uh, it's very. Um, it calms me. So that's why I did that. Yeah? Do you know if there is any connection between the Harley Davidson and the Hells Angels? I think there is absolutely none. I think the Harley Davidson try to distance themselves from the Hells Angels uh, in any way they can. But the, th the strange thing about it is that without the 1% clubs, as we call them, I don't think Harley-Davidson would actually be the big seller that it is today because 
a lot of ordinary people would like to buy a little bit of that bad boy image, which the Hells Angels and the Bandidos and all the other clubs have given the bike. Um, but I don't think there is any uh, connection at all. They would rather just go. Okay, if there's nothing else, then uh, I will move on to the next. Uh, last year I, I was commissioned by uh, a hotel group called Choice to do a book. They were building a new hotel in Oslo in Tjuvholmen called The Thief. And um, it is built, where it's built Tjuvholmen was a place where thieves used to hang out. It was a place where they would hang thieves. It was a really sort of, uh, it was a den. So they called the hotel the thief, and uh, they said they wanted to make a book where we took, I think, either 32 or 22 uh, known, well-known Norwegians. We placed them in a, in a showroom in a massive hangar in Oslo. The showroom was built an exact copy of one of the rooms in the hotel. Uh, it was 32 square meters, I think. And I set out to photograph each single person in the same room, but to create a different, uh, a different look and atmosphere for each one of them. They were all asked to, to uh, they were interviewed and asked to tell about difficult uh, periods in their life. And um, the proceeds of the book went to uh, an organization called Nettverk at Asoning which is basically an organization that helps convicts when they get out of jail to, you know, get back into society. So these are some of the, the, the portraits. The, the, the guy on the cover is uh, our former justice, Minister of Justice, Knut Storberge. This is uh, one of the guys from the band Aha, Magne Fureholmen. So well known, I thought it was no point in showing his face. Uh, this woman is uh, called Karina Holikim. She's a really well known uh, extreme skier. And she used to para, I don't know if it's called para ski or paraglide or whatever, but she would jump in a parachute and. Uh, she would ski off a cliff and jump in a parachute. But one time the parachute didn't open, so she was uh, nearly killed, broke an enormous amount of bones in her body, but uh, managed to, uh, to pull herself back into life and, and walk again. Now she's actually skiing again as well. This is... Uh, the lawyer of Anders Bering Breivik. I oh, know I forgot his name. Lippista, yes. Getting old. But just remember that all of these pictures are done in one small room with slight adjustments. Oh, that was very light. This is my wife. We just took uh, blankets and covered the whole room in, uh, in bed sheets. We included uh, several former convicts that actually work in uh, Nettwerk at Asoning. And this guy is called Johnny Irisio. This is another guy. The strange thing was that we used animals in three pictures and all of them were with the, the former convicts. I don't know why. This is uh, Axel Henny, shot in the shower. This is Arne Treholt. For those not Norwegian, he was accused of being a spy and jailed for telling uh, things to the Russians way back. Any uh, questions so far? I tried to show his two sides. 
This woman was a well-known madam. She ran whores or prostitutes. I was jailed for that. This is the, uh, the boxer, Cecilia Brekhus. I thought it was quite, quite interesting to take a person which is very vital and very strong and has an aggressive sport and make her quite fragile and ladylike. Uh, I've forgotten the name of this woman. I think it's Louisa Luby or something in that. Stoltenberg. This is a, an artist called uh, Ida Maria. I, on doing this, I work with a team of, of stylists and, uh, and um, makeup artists that I formerly worked with on, on uh, Norwegian Top Model. So we sort of try to, to plan each portrait and take these people slightly out of the comfort zone and create a different, different world for them. Samsaya. Now I'm going to Mitt namn är Marcel Lelienhoff. Jag är er fotograf på detta porträttprojekt. Det är er mycket ambitiöst porträttprojekt som vi ska göra för det tid. Vi ska fotografera en runt ja, 3 kanske 23 personer i ett litet showroom på 30 kvadrat som står i en hangar på 20 meter. Ganska komplicerat för det blir ju så att det blir nästan inte mer än lite över en kvadrat per person hvis man ska göra olika porträtt på alle, og det er det vi prøver å gjøre. Og alle skal få sitt eget særpreg, alle skal tas ut av komfortzonen sin, og det skal styles og lages en spennende filmatisk setting på hver person. Vi har utfordret mange til å gjøre ting som de sikkert ikke egentlig trodde de kom til å gjøre. Og jeg tror de kommer til å få en veldig fin serie med bilder. Og hvis man hadde sett rommet her, altså størrelsen og hvor mye sängen tar och skap och andra ting så vill man känna att uh, det har varit en, en kamp att komma i mål. Spennende er jo selvfølgelig det at vi lager en utstilling og en bok som går til inntekt for nettverk etter soning. Og det er jo et veldig, veldig godt tiltak, så det, det tror jeg har vært veldig viktig for folk å være med på. Så jeg må si at ja, man kan bare si seg bare for at man får lov å være med. Da. And that's all for me today. It wants to play again. <laughs> Anything else before I leave you? There are five minutes. Uh, if it's some more questions.
Thank you so much. Fantastic. It has been a pleasure. Okay.